Stanford University. Thanks, Craig. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and see such a large audience. I also just want to reiterate the thanks to all of you. It's been such a privilege leading the program on food security and the environment, and really without the intellectual, institutional, and financial support of all of you, we couldn't do it at all. Now, as we talked about, this program is uh, very large. We have about 15 different projects trying to see how can we feed a world of 6.8 billion now, going towards 9 or 10 billion in the future, and not destroy the environment in the process. And I'm not going to talk about all those projects. I thought I would just take one slice, marine finfish aquaculture, and give you a sense of the way we are kind of approaching problem solving in this uh, program. And as we look at um, aquaculture um, and capture fisheries, you can see in the solid lines there, the bottom solid line is forage fisheries and the top is non-forage fishery capture. It's been pretty steady at about 80 million metric tons uh, for quite a while now, but the bars are aquaculture or cultured fish production, which has been rising very rapidly. Now one out of two fish on your plate are coming from farms. And the growth has just been enormous. Aquaculture has grown fivefold in the past 20 years, really driven off the depletion of wild fisheries, but also on the demand side, population growth and increasing consumption because of income growth. We've seen a doubling of seafood consumption since the 70s are really driving the system as well. It's a highly traded product, both capture and, and farmed. And um, as much as we like to think about feeding the world, this is also a really lucrative business opportunity. And so our question here is, um, can aquaculture really so solve the problems of depleted fisheries, or is it just contributing to the problems? And there are a lot of environmental challenges in this industry. For example, the use of marine resources as feed ingredients for aquaculture, the escape of these capture cultured fish into the wild, breeding and competition with wild fisheries, the spread of diseases from farms or parasites like sea lice to wild fisheries, and, and then the demise of wild fisheries as a result, pollution. And then if we really are going to scale this up and feed the world you know, on aquaculture, you know, what does that really entail? And so our approach more generally in the program on food security and the environment has been uh, threefold. One, we convene different groups of experts to address specific problems like these addressed above. Um, we do a lot of survey and field studies in specific countries. And we also do a fair amount of modeling work. And I just want to give you a, a glimpse of each of these in the context of marine aquaculture. On the feed issue, for example, what we've seen in the fishery sector is we're fishing down the food webs. We've gone from swordfish, tuna, and so forth, and increasingly as a proportion we're seeing more and more of these small fisheries like uh, sardines, anchovies, and so forth comprising a larger share of the capture of fish catch. Um, and meanwhile, we're farming up the food chain, meaning we're going from catfish in the southern United States up to farming salmon, which requires fishery inputs, or ranching tuna, which requires a lot of fishery inputs for feeds. Salmon, for example, the most recent figures show that five kilograms of wild fish are needed to produce each one kilogram of farmed salmon. And so, you know, we're really, it's, it could be depleting, and particularly as we as consumers demand long-chain omega-3s that are coming from these wild fish inputs. So this is a case where lately we've um, convened a group um, of experts on this topic. Uh, this group is comprised of fish nutritionists who have worked with the aquaculture industry, experts on plant-based and animal-based proteins and oils, uh, people who have done research on genetically modified oils that could substitute for what you get out of sardines and anchovies. And some of these people actually have been my largest critics in the past, and it's such a contentious issue what the real numbers are and how they can be used in policy. My approach was to convene the best and the brightest in this group, even if they are my largest critics, and say, can we agree on these numbers? And uh, this was work that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy um, just in September, and what we found as, uh, and we really had fun doing this, but what we found as a group was that because aquaculture volume is increasing so enormously, despite improvements in feed inputs, we still have increased uh, demand for feeds, and that's going to go on into the future. 
And so our goal was to review all the technological advances in research, the different management approaches that could be used, really with the target of reducing uh, any kind of demand on the marine resource base as aquaculture grows. And we also knew that from a policy point of view, we couldn't just target aquaculture. We had to think about ecosystem management of forage fisheries because if aquaculture is not using these fish, livestock is going to be using this fish. So we have a suite of policy uh, analyses in this work as well. And it just happened that this work, and this is really luck, not skill, I have to say, that uh, this work came out exactly the week that um, it was being discussed on the Hill, the expansion of aquaculture into federal waters of the United States. And, and this was huge discussion at, at several different levels that we were able to fit into very nicely. And I think one benefit of being in the Woods Institute is getting the leverage from a study like this um, with the Woods staff, Mark Schwartz, Mike Murphy, Pam Sterner in the Aldo Leopold program, Ashley Dean in our program, we were able to get the word out about 70 different journals and newspapers and so forth picked this up, Washington Post, Boston Globe and so forth. So it really elevated this at a time it was being discussed in policy. Even the Zimbabwe, sorry, I have to say they probably have bigger issues to worry about, but they even covered it. You know. so, so the staff here was enormously helpful in me of getting, getting this out actually at a very timely moment in policy. Um, the second approach we use is a survey approach, really, in my view, being on the ground, understand how things are operating on the ground is probably much more important than all the library or modeling research we can do. Uh, but this is an example of work in China. China accounts for about two-thirds of global aquaculture production and about 25% of the global fish meal demand. Um, but the data on this are very uncertain. In fact, China is the 800-pound gorilla in the room for aquaculture, but no one really has the right data. No one really quite knows what to do in terms of the environmental community or the policy community. And the Packard Foundation is now supporting work of ours uh, to actually just go out and do survey work on both the production and consumption side to get the numbers that can be used in this dialogue now. Um, in association with our colleagues at the Center for Chinese, Chinese Center for Agricultural Policy Analysis within the National Academy there very strong links to the policy um, link. Um, another survey that we're doing is in Chile. Chile is now the largest, well, had reached the status of the world's largest salmon aquaculture producer and was just so bent on productivity growth and becoming the largest producer that it was completely unsustainable and collapsed uh, almost entirely due to a disease outbreak, infectious salmon anemia. And this is work that's now um, being supported by a Woods EVP, Environmental Ventures Project. Um, on the project, our faculty from history to try to understand the social evolution and change that has occurred in this area, salmon. Aquaculture is in the poorest part of the country. Has this been a real benefit or now a real cost to that segment of society? Um, and it's also history, economics, biology and uh, law are all faculty members. And it's also linked to um, the EIPER program. My student here on the left at the bottom there, Andy Gerhardt, is in the field and in association with some local institutions has now completed a survey of 850 households in this region to get the kind of data for the first time to understand the social impacts of such intensive aquaculture production. And the last prong of our sort of problem-solving approach is doing modeling work. And if we think about just all the nutrients and chemicals that come out of these open net pens, feces, other waste into the ocean, you know, the solution really in the past has been just dilution is the solution. But the question is, will that work at any scale? You know, you might have one pen that's out there, but once you start scaling up, what is, are these just sort of feedlots of the ocean now? And so we're working in association with um, Jeff Kosseff and Oliver Fringer in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering to start modeling waste flows out of these net pens. And here on the bottom is the fish pen in the environment, modeled in the environment with tides, the bathymetry, um, and the other components of the, of the coastal ecosystem in which the pens take place. And up here you can see model runs in a representative bay like the Monterey Bay, for example, but the wastes you can see as modeled are not dispersed uniformly. They're very cohesive over time and space. And I think this is now being used in policy discussions in California and um, in federally and to 
how wastes really should be treated in aquaculture as it continues to grow. So I'll just end with our strategy as a whole has been really to focus on some of the major environmental and equity issues in intensive food production. We can't solve everything, but we try to pick the major countries, major food systems, major uh, problems that are out there and take it very much from an interdisciplinary perspective, drawing on whatever resources we have at Stanford, and I've given you a number of different disciplines here, but drawing from the outside when it's necessary. Um, really a lot of emphasis on field-based knowledge and sound analytics, and I think that's where we want to contain our growth to make sure that we're doing the best work possible. Um, and that has policy relevance. We've been involved in a lot of discussions in aquaculture, in California legislation, as well as federal legislation, and are moving into um, policy discussions in Chile and China, for example. So our goal is to stay central to the science and policy in this field. And as I said, this is one example of many types of projects that we have, ranging from climate, livestock, food security, uh, different in innovative technologies in agriculture and so forth. So thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.